um, are backed by substantial amounts of field work. Austin is a real boots on the ground guy. He just got back last week from a three month uh, stint as an intelligence analyst uh, on the ground in Afghanistan, in, in Kabul and Kandahar. Um, he previously worked as an associate political scientist for the RAND Corporation, uh, and in that capacity he served in Iraq as an analyst and advisor to the multinational force in Iraq uh, and the U.S. military. His most recent book is um, entitled Deterrence from, um, from Cold War to Long War, Lessons from Six De Decades of RAND Research, uh, and that was published by RAND in 2008. So. I don't really have a PowerPoint. I have a, a picture and a map, so. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you guys can move or not, as you, I, I might blind you with the laser um, As uh, Stuart and Kim talked about, um, I think September 11th had a profound effect on everyone, uh, me no less than anyone. Uh, on September 11th, 2001, as a not really very reconstructed meathead, I was sparring at a gym in Atlanta that morning. My sparring partner and I took a break, walked over to where the TVs were, um, there was reports that a plane had hit uh, one of the World Trade Centers. Um, as Stuart sort of indicated, my, my initial reaction was similar. You know, planes have hit big buildings in New York again. It's probably a light plane, no big deal. So we're sort of sitting there chatting and sweating uh, as the second plane uh, hits. And uh, that, was a, that was a pretty emotional moment, I think, for everybody. Um, and then if you fast forward a few years uh, to, to now, I've spent about a third of the past four years in some combination of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And that, that you know, ha have, have no fear that would not have been the case had September 11th not happened. So uh, a profound impact on me in terms of, of my career, where I've been, what I've done. So that brings us to the picture, a little, a little show with the tell. Um, this is a, a view from a special forces compound in southern Afghanistan taken this past July. Um, had a not so great day there. Uh, Outpost of Progress as the caption. For those of you that read Joseph Conrad, you'll note the somewhat ironic nature of that caption. Um, there, is, there is progress there, uh, but perhaps not as much as we would like, and, and in many ways, not the kind of progress we would like. So I'm going to talk today about Afghanistan and the war on terror. Um, I should note that I'm speaking only for myself and for no other entity that has ever employed me however foolishly, uh, to, to do any work on this. Uh, and I'm not really going to talk in detail about the specifics I was up to in, in Afghanistan this past summer. So, so general map of, of the region. Uh, it's kind of a busy map. Why are we in Afghanistan? Um, the administration, current administration, has identified two main reasons. So I'm going to talk to the threats that, that get us into, into Afghanistan and, and its region. Uh, I'm going to talk to the problems we face in Afghanistan, and I'm going to talk to some of the options for dealing with those problems. Uh, I say options because I don't really think there are solutions. So what are the threats? The two identified threats, first uh, and foremost, uh, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda continues to exist both in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, uh, in areas right here, Pakistan, and then up here, parts of Afghanistan, like Nuristan. Uh, not so much down here in the south, but there is some, and not, not really substantial presence down here in, in Baluchistan, part of Pakistan. Um, so that's, that's one interest driving uh, the US presence, is, is uh, the ability to, to prevent Al Qaeda from having safe havens of the kind they enjoyed before 2001. The second is the security and safety of Pakistani nuclear weapons and nuclear material, apparently. They, they want to get me on record, no matter how far away from the mic I get. Uh, so uh, while there is a real threat of, of sanctuary, however, however modest, and maybe in Q&A we can talk about what the real threat of sanctuary is of Al Qaeda, it is a real threat. Uh, I think the idea that the United States is in Afghanistan to protect Pakistan's nuclear material um, borders on farcical. Um, there's, there's this notion that uh, somehow if the Afghan Taliban that I'll talk about in a, in a minute take over some or all of Afghanistan, that somehow Pakistan will become the next domino to fall. Uh, I think this is even less credible than the domino theory in Southeast Asia some 50 years ago. Uh, as I'll talk to, uh, the folks we're fighting in Afghanistan are distinct from the folks that the Pakistanis are fighting and are in fact supported by the Pakistani state uh, at a minimum tacitly, and there's pretty good evidence uh, explicitly. 
So uh, Pakistan's nuclear material, to the extent that it's at risk, is not at risk from things that happen in Afghanistan. It is at risk. It's at risk due to things happening inside Pakistan. Um, and you know, that's a real concern that the United States should take very seriously. Uh, it's one that has to be dealt with inside Pakistan. Uh, we could put 100,000, 1 million, however many troops we want to put in Afghanistan. It is not going to make the risk that someone at Gokuda Research Lab uh, in Pakistan uh, will smuggle some nuclear material out any less likely. Um, you know, this notion that somehow having a sanctuary inside Afghanistan will enable various extremist groups to mount some sort of major offensive against a Pakistani military base and steal a nuclear weapon uh, is completely incredible. Uh, it, if, the, if the threat is real, it comes from within Pakistan. So that's just my take on the, the, two, the two different threats we face, and that will sort of color the diagnosis of options later. So let's talk about the problems we face in Afghanistan in attempting to deal with these two problems. There's three interlocking layers of problems. The first is regional, the second are sort of country or state level, and the third are local. And these all tie in together to make uh, one hell of a mess. So what are the regional problems? Uh, in addition to US interests, there are four major players in Afghanistan and the border region of Pakistan. Uh, they are Pakistan, India, Iran, and Russia. And I'm not really going to talk to Russia. I think Alex did a great job of that, other than to say that the United States is increasingly relying on what's called the Northern Distribution Network to bring supplies into Afghanistan, and that network runs straight through Russia. Um, so in reducing reliance on Pakistan as a source of, of logistics, the United States has increased reliance on Russia. So it's a, it's a sort of pick your poison. Someone is going to have leverage over you, um, and the United States has increasingly decided they would leather, rather have Russia have leverage than Pakistan. So what about the other three? Pakistan is, let's not kid ourselves, pursuing its own strategic interests, which are only partly coterminous with those of the United States. Uh, Pakistan has no real great friendship to Al Qaeda. Uh, you know, rumors to the contrary, I don't really believe that uh, the Pakistani state was actively harboring Osama bin Laden. I say that having been to Abbottabad about a year before uh, Osama bin Laden was, was killed there. Um, so they're not great friends of Al Qaeda. However, they do rely and have a history of relying heavily on Islamic extremists as proxies in their wars with India and also in their, in their attempts to control uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. That hasn't changed. Uh, they continue to support uh, the different groups, which I'll talk to in a moment, uh, in terms of, of their goals inside Afghanistan. So you have to distinguish first and foremost between, between AQ, Al-Qaeda, and these other groups. Um, and Pakistan has a, has a real interest in supporting them. So they play a double game. They will support the United States in some issues, particularly dealing with Al-Qaeda, in exchange for all the various forms of aid the United States provides. At the same time, they essentially continue to sponsor and support and give sanctuary to the folks that are, we're fighting uh, against in Afghanistan. So that's a, that's a very serious problem, as you can imagine. Um, it, the analogy that's been made to me by uh, one military officer was, uh, imagine if we had tried to be allies with North Vietnam during the Vietnam War uh, as we were fighting in South Vietnam. It's, it's deeply challenging uh, to, to avoid using the kind of salty language I was using this summer. Uh, second, India. Uh, a lot of, of Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan is driven by its perception uh, of Indian influence there. They're always going to have an influence just based, uh, or an interest in Afghanistan just based on uh, you know, the geographical proximity and the fact that uh, many Afghans consider this part of Pakistan to, to really belong to Afghanistan. So there's always going to be a Pakistani interest, but Indian activities inside Afghanistan have really amped them up. And in fact, they claim uh, various Indian consulates are really a vehicle for Indian intelligence activities, sponsoring the Baluch insurgency down here and various other nefarious activities. And, uh, you know, you can't always believe the Pakistanis when they claim that that India is up to no good, but you know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that there's, there's no evidence they're not after you. And India is up to certain things inside Afghanistan, though it's a little opaque to what extent. So India plays a, a, a non-trivial role here. And I'll note, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, the, the Civil War in the 1990s, India actively supported uh, the Northern Alliance uh, inside that war. Third, Iran. Uh, Iran plays a, a role in supporting the insurgency not really because it has any ideological affinity towards it. In fact, the, the Taliban regime that the United States overthrew 
was actually pretty hostile and, and nearly came to, to war with Iran uh, before 2001. But Iran is a, is a big believer in the whole uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend thing and is willing to provide at least low levels of support uh, to the Taliban inside Afghanistan. And then finally, as I mentioned, Russia. So we have this, this regional witch's brew going on. If you move one level of analysis down to the state level, the United States did intervene in a civil war between essentially a northern alliance consisting of Tajiks, Uzbeks, and Hazaras against a Taliban regime that was almost exclusively Pashtun. Um, we, the United States, have sort of pretended that that went away, that that civil war ended when, when we uh, decisively gave victory to one side, and that now what's going on is a war between a state and a rebel group. And my argument is that's not really true. We are still fundamentally in the midst of a civil war. The insurgency we are fighting inside Afghanistan is almost wholly a Pashtun phenomenon. There are small, as I'll talk to you in a minute, small elements of Uzbeks uh, that, are, that are involved for religious reasons, but by and large, uh, the insert, you can find the insurgency in Afghanistan wherever three Pashtuns can walk together unmolested. Where that's not true, you don't really have much of an insurgency. So we're in the midst of a civil war, and, and because we've confused ourselves on the and confused ourselves on the diagnosis of this problem, uh, to some extent we've confused ourselves on the solution. Then finally, you have the local level dynamics. Uh, even at the, at the level of the district, for, for example, the, the district in the picture I showed earlier, uh, which is uh, almost all Pashtun with a small Hazara community, you have tribal factions, you have different power broker factions, et cetera. So even within the Pashtun community, uh, you don't have homogenous interest in either supporting or fighting against the United States. Some Pashtuns, for, for various reasons, including good old filthy lucre, are strong supporters of the United States. Many are not. Um, so you have that level of dynamics that, that makes the situation even more complicated. So I'll talk briefly about the groups we're dealing with, uh, the problem of the Afghan government, and then move on to options and conclude. So as I mentioned, you have to distinguish between Al-Qaeda and the various other groups. Uh, the, main the main way to distinguish these, these groups is what their goals are. Al-Qaeda has transnational expansive goals, whether it's actually the establishment of a caliphate or just getting the United States out of Islamic countries is open to question, but the point is it does have transnational goals. The other groups that we look at inside, uh, inside the Afghan insurgency are primarily interested in local causes. So there's three principal groups. Uh, the first is Hizb Islami Gulbuddin. This is an organization that's been around since the 1980s. The United States actually supported it against the Soviets. Uh, it, it's, it's less important than it was at one time, but it's still prominent, uh, particularly in areas up here. Uh, they're little, this is mostly uh, Tajik, Uzbek country, but there are pockets of Pashtuns up there, and so that's where a lot of their support is. Uh, there's the Quetta Shura Taliban. This is the sort of reconstituted government, Taliban government that the United States overthrew uh, in 2001. Its principal strongholds are in Kandahar, Helmand, and then, of course, across the border here in Quetta, hence the name Quetta Shura, and then on down into Karachi. Um, some people even argue it should be renamed the Karachi Shura Taliban because their presence there is so great now. The third group is the Haqqani Network. This is probably the most lethal organization in uh, Afghanistan, and it's the one probably most closely tied to Pakistani intelligence. Its stronghold is what they call Loya Paktia, this region of Paktia, Paktika, and Khost province over here, um, and then across the border here in, uh, in the federally administered tribal areas. Um, there's actually no interest, that, uh, no evidence that indicates the Haqqani network has much interest beyond this part of Afghanistan, much less of a transnational nature, despite having much of the same religious ideology uh, as, as Al-Qaeda. So I think, you know, in the same way that you could distinguish between flavors of communists uh, during the Soviet, uh, during, the, during the Cold War, you similarly have to distinguish between flavors of Islamists now. Um, and, you know, the analogy might be the difference between uh, you know, world revolution of Trotsky and socialism in one country. The Haqqani network is definitely a sort of Islamism in one country or even Islamism in one little subpart of a country. Uh, and then finally, there are a few other groups. Um, I won't really talk about the Pakistani Taliban um, other than to say that the, the distinction is the Pakistani Taliban's interests are all aimed here inside Pakistan uh, and, and are against the Pakistani state primarily. Um, and don't really have support from the Pakistani state, obviously, because they're fighting against it. 
Um, there's also the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan that, that Alex alluded to. That's really the only Uzbek component of the insurgency. And they're a lot closer to Al-Qaeda in their sort of worldview uh, than they are to, say, the Haqqani network. An additional problem we face is the Afghan government. I won't belabor the point on corruption. I think people are aware of it. I will say that uh, in condemning corruption full stop, I think the United States misses, misses a little bit of the point. Uh, the issue is, is about how resources get divided. And we have a hang up in this country about it being done informally, but this is a fairly common thing, that, that patronage networks uh, informally distribute resources. Here in New York, we infamously uh, you know, had, had a good century of that. Uh, in, in Chicago, I think that's still going on, though maybe it's, maybe it's changing. Um, and the issue is not so much how the resources get distributed, but, but to whom they get distributed. And the problem in Afghanistan is you don't have very many what I would call good mafioso. A good mafioso knows it's easier to give somebody a, a little taste of the, of the revenues than it is to fight them. Um, and I think for sort of shadow of the future reasons that we can talk about in Q&A, uh, you know, most mafioso in Afghanistan want to put as much money in their pocket as possible rather than distributing it broadly. In areas where you see power brokers or warlords or whatever term of art you want to use, distribute resources more, more broadly, you have fewer problems. Um, and I'll highlight a particularly uh, nasty guy down here who is now the chief of police, uh, Brigadier General Abdul Razik, who is you know, not a very nice guy, but he's pretty good at distributing resources. And he's managed to keep the spin Boldock region right here at the border relatively secure. I mean, this should be one of the least secure places in Afghanistan because it's, it's right across the border from the stronghold of the Quetta Shura in, in their home province. And yet it's relatively secure in part because he's been a good mafioso. So just, you know, in thinking about corruption, I, I would highlight that, that there's maybe not good and bad corruption, but there's functional and dysfunctional corruption. Um, and the problem in Afghanistan is there's a lot of dysfunctional corruption. So I'll conclude uh, by talking about what the U.S. options are. First, I'll highlight what the current plan is. The United States is drawing down, even as we speak, with the goal of reaching 68,000 troops from the current roughly 100,000 uh, by the end of 2012. This will be followed by an additional drawdown to a minimal number. I mean, the, the, the headline number is zero, but zero never means zero, by the end of 2014. So that's the, that's the current plan. Clearly through 2012, the, the current administration will have, have say, so I have high confidence we'll get to that number. Um, but as you're all aware, we have an election intervening there, and I think the, the next administration and the next Congress and their attitudes will have a profound impact on where we actually are in 2014. So what are our options? Well, one option that has been brooded quite a lot is reconciliation, essentially a, a negotiated se settlement with the Taliban. Uh, President Karzai in Afghanistan has actually called the Taliban his brothers and sort of offered them to come to the table, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I won't say it's impossible, but I think it borders on a pipe dream, at least as things currently stand. Um, there are two reasons for this. One is simply uh, the number of players that have to be satisfied by any set of negotiations and what I think is a fairly small Venn diagram overlap between their interests. So the four minimal players are the United States, Pakistan, the government of Afghanistan, the Taliban, and the former Northern Alliance network. In other words, the Tajik, Uzbeks, and Hazaras that the United States relied on to overthrow the Taliban regime. Uh, I think the, the ability to find an acceptable compromise on a, a future of Afghanistan between these groups is, is vanishingly small. The second is, from the Taliban's perspective, you could either take a slice of the pie now or you know, they have access to, to CNN and Al Jazeera just like the rest of us, hang tough for another three years and potentially get all the pie. And I think that that shadow of the future weighs pretty heavily on Taliban and also Pakistani calculations. If you think the United States is really not going to stick around, you can take everything down the road. And in fact, even if you do come to the table, uh, I think it will be a sort of, uh, you know, again, to draw that Southeast Asia analogy, it will be a temporary pause that will allow them to refresh before final victory. All right, so that's not working. Uh, the United States could leave entirely. Just actually follow the plan. Zero actually means zero. Um, bug out. I think that's problematic as well. Um, you know, there, there are Al-Qaeda here. I mean, for reals. Not that many, but hundreds, 
And it doesn't, you know, Al Qaeda is not a divisional organization. They don't need 10,000 men under arms to, to conduct attacks. Um, and, you know, the United States' presence in Afghanistan doesn't just enable direct action. Um, these blue circles, by the way, are the radius of an unrefueled combat helicopter if you wanted to conduct an operation. You will note, perhaps uncoincidentally, that this extends deep into Pakistan, including to Abbottabad over there. Uh, so the United States not only can conduct direct action from Afghanistan, but it's crucial for intelligence collection. Uh, you don't have to have many troops on the ground to collect intelligence, but you can't have zero. Um, that's true for both technical intelligence uh, of most kinds and for human intelligence. So I think leaving entirely is not a good option. Um, so, you know, a, a, as Professor Betts started from, sometimes you can overreact, sometimes you can underreact. You know, you want that Goldilocks solution, which I argue is to retain a fairly small but non-trivial enduring presence in Afghanistan post-2014. Um, and in Q&A, we can talk about, about numbers, but I think that the numbers are not tiny. They're not going to be 1,000, but neither do they have to be 30, 40, 50,000. Uh, I think uh, somewhere between, you know, depending on how ambitious your goals are about the structure of the Afghan state, somewhere between six and about 25,000, depending on, on what you, uh, how, how ambitious your goals are, um, would be sufficient. And so I'll stop there and we can get to Q&A. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, okay, so how we'd like to run things from here um, is before we open it up to audience questions, I'd like to run down the panel in the order they presented and uh, give everyone three or four minutes to uh, add a comment, ask a question of another panelist. There's always already been a little bit of crosstalk, uh, or just add whatever you'd like. And while we're doing that, um, the audience uh, can start lining up at the microphone. So uh, we'll take questions only um, at the microphone up here. Um, if you're going to ask a question, we'd like you to first introduce yourself. And we'd also like to encourage um, short questions and, and make sure what you'd like to say is actually a question. So I'll. Uh, I'm, I'll reserve the right to kind of intervene and uh, focus uh, speakers if they seem to be kind of uh, going on and on and in an editorial kind of fashion. So um, with that, we'll start with um, Dr. Gottlieb. Thanks. Uh, I thought that was a bunch of great presentations. I learned a lot, and, and I, I agree with much of what was said, and I think it added to my understanding of terrorism. Um, that being said, I, uh, I disagree with some things that were said today respectfully. Um, uh, one, one, one issue, let me just push back on just for a minute, is this, the temptation to, to disassociate uh, centralized al-Qaeda, which I think is more than just the few hundred individuals, as Austin pointed out, mostly in Afghan-Pakistan border, um, which is also an ideology that is inspirational and it connects to affiliated groups and individuals around the world. And I think there's a temptation in political science to try to look at the, look at the trees and understand um, some of the micro issues related to uh, Al Qaeda and some of its affiliated organizations and its actions, but I think we have to keep we have to keep, be mindful of the interconnections and the way that the threads weave through a lot of these different players, not just in Central Asia but but around the world. Um, I agree with much of what Austin said. Uh, his 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 description of the different groups in the region uh, in Central Asia, um, they do have different motivations, and they they may one day uh, even separate from each other uh, further, but. I, I think that they're more interconnected um, than was made out by Austin and, and a few other uh, folks that spoke about uh, the nature of Al Qaeda. Let me give you, Austin, one quote from, um, from Secretary Gates from last year. Uh, he was pushing back on the Pakistanis a little bit, um, who were saying that, that some of the groups that they're supporting are, are a little bit uh, less uh, dangerous than others. And, and Gates pushed back and he said, um, he said, dividing these individual extremist groups into individual pockets, if you will, is in my view a mistaken way to look at the challenge we all face. He went on to say, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban in Afghanistan, Tariqi Taliban in Pakistan, Lashkari Taiba, the Haqqani Network, this is a syndicate of terrorists that work together. And when one succeeds, they all benefit, and they share ideas, they share planning, they don't operationally coordinate their activities, as best as I can tell, but they're in close contact, they take inspiration from one another, they take ideas from one another, unquote. Um, I would agree with that, uh, and I'm sure Austin would agree with much of that uh, in Central Asia, but I would also agree with much of that with groups that are not 
directly linked with the current conflict in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, of the 43 terrorist organizations, uh, designated terrorist organizations in the State Department annual list, uh, 25 of them are Islamist uh, terrorist organizations. I don't know if that affects page some of the stuff you said, but 20, uh, 25 of the 43 of the U.S. State Department list are Islamist terrorist groups, um, and just a cursory uh, back of the envelope look at this would say at least three quarters of those are in some ways interconnected by some strings, uh, whether it's through affiliates of affiliates uh, or even just a common ideology where they get inspired, as Gates said, uh, uh, from one another. So I think that my final point is, because I want to say something about what, what Kim uh, brought up also, um, is there's this temptation to look locally, and I think that that's a good, uh, you know, um, research path, and to start thinking locally rather than globally, and seeing what is, what are the motivations of some of these groups. Um, but I think Spain, which is one of the examples you brought up, where there was, you know, a quote unquote, I don't know if you call it successful, or the terrorism seemed to work, in the sense that the Madrid bombings uh, did get uh, Spain to withdraw uh, within just a few months all of their troops from from Iraq. Uh, which is one of the goals of the Madrid bombing in March of 2004. So unfortunately, some, some political scientists, Robert Pape, uh, others, would look at that as an example of a, of a success uh, because of a foreign intervention and to get foreign occupiers out of a foreign land and bring them home. Um, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, what is often not reported, in, and what many people actually don't know because it was not a successful attack, was eight months after the Madrid bombings in March of 2004, there was a second attack planned uh, with about 23 individuals from North Africa, a few Pakistanis, and some uh, from Spain itself uh, with another plot. And this was after the troops were withdrawn from Iraq, uh, and that plot was to blow up a Tosha, a Tosha station again and a variety of other uh, symbols and uh, a skyscraper, um, Real Madrid soccer stadium during a soccer match. Uh, simultaneous attack, uh, the way Al Qaeda likes to do them, um, and that that attack was disrupted. But the point I'm making is, um, yes, there was a local feeling to withdraw, uh, you know, Spanish troops from Iraq uh, along the lines of Pape. But the bigger goals of the jihadi groups in that particular case was not about Iraq, and it wasn't even about Afghanistan, where Spain had a few troops. It was the fact that they think that Spain is part of the original caliphate, and they're going to keep attacking Spain, these groups and these networks of groups, until Spain gets back to uh, its place uh, in, the, in the 13th century, uh, southern Spain, Andalusia. Um, and that's a much bigger goal, and Robert Pape does not account for these global goals, although a lot of people do die, and a lot of plots are, are planned according to this global ideology, and these, these, these are strings of networks that connect uh, around the world. Final point on Sageman, I have one minute left. Uh, I, like, I like Mark Sageman. Um, he, wrote a nice he wrote a nice review of my book, so I don't want to say anything too bad about him. Um, however, uh, the idea that it's mostly just small self-starters or miscreants um, that are the big problem, I don't disagree that that is a problem. Um, where I do disagree is that these individuals are only radicalized over the internet uh, and in their uh, living rooms. Um, we are unfortunately seeing, as centralized al-Qaeda diminishes, the rise of affiliated groups which do have space to operate, unfortunately, in places like um, uh, West, uh, East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula and North Africa. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we have to be vigilant and, and keep, keep up some of the efforts, I think Austin presented them correctly in Central Asia, what we need to do um, offshore counterterrorism uh, along the lines of what some of the things I discussed. But uh, we shouldn't discount the threat as just being individuals at this point. Um, it is, there are affiliates, and these affiliates are now competing in some ways to see which will replace possibly a centralized al-Qaeda and be sort of the, the new vanguard of the, what they see as a global revolution, which I don't believe will ever succeed, but it doesn't matter what I believe, it matters what they believe. And, uh, Thanks. All right. Professor Martin. Poor Austin. I'm going to take him on, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> two comments. Um, duck. <laughs> first of all, I think that Austin is too dismissive of the uh, benefit of having some presence in Afghanistan for uh, the uh, nuclear situation in Pakistan, and that's because the intelligence that U.S. forces are getting in Afghanistan is not limited to the uh, immediate war. It's also intelligence about what's happening in Pakistan, um, and that um, actually having a, a military presence on the ground that is trying to uh, make the state more stable and therefore make it more comfortable for a small U.S. military presence to stay over the long term is something that probably contributes to the long-term interest of 
um, keeping an eye on what's happening in Pakistan. So I think the two are more connected than maybe uh, Austin's presentation um, was highlighting. Um, but the second thing I really want to take on about what Austin said um, was the idea that patronage and warlords can be a good thing. Um, and I have two comments here. Um, the first, this is the theme of my book, by the way, so it's something I care about passionately. And I think what Austin is bringing up, but maybe not putting in the entire context, is the difference between short-term and long-term thinking about security effects. Austin's absolutely correct that in the short term, when we're concerned about immediate security interests, working through patronage networks with people like warlords and other power brokers can be absolutely necessary for U.S. security goals. There's no question that that's true. But there's also, also no question that in the long term, patronage is really detrimental to U.S. security goals and the goals of the rest of the world, including of, of local actors. Um, and that's basically for a couple of reasons. One is that by definition, patronage is really unstable. Um, if one person is the person that you're relying on for all of your security needs and that person gets assassinated, all of a sudden everything is up for grabs. Patronage is by definition not institutionalized. It's something that relies on personal connections rather than something that relies on institutionalized laws and rules with rules for secession. And that's something that actually distinguishes patronage in Afghanistan from, for example, um, the American Mafia, where there are some rules for secession in place. A lot of people believe that one of the reasons that Mexico is in such tough shape at the moment um, is that they are now attacking people, assassinating people, jailing people. There are no rules for secession, and so everybody's competing over the spoils, and that's where the violence is coming from. The second is that patronage, by definition, excludes some people. You can't have patronage if you give to everybody. You have to only give to the people who agree to support you. And in many of the cases in Afghanistan, as Austin well knows, patronage is defined by ethnic networks. It's defined by um, various kinds of clan networks. And that means there are people who are excluded. Why does that matter? Because all of the evidence indicates that political violence and terrorism are caused by people who are facing political inequality and a sense of a lack of political opportunity. Um, and so that means that over the long term, patronage is something that may very well lead to increased levels of violence um, because uh, the people who are not included in the patronage networks uh, feel excluded. And I think there's evidence that that is one of the reasons for support of the Taliban in the Pakistani tribal areas. And so we can, we can talk about that in more depth. So there's this real sense of unease here. How do you get your short-term security interests met when over the long term getting those security interests met may actually undermine your security? And I don't have an answer, but I think that's the framework that it should be put into. One more comment. Just when we're thinking about patronage, I think there's a real danger in saying this is the way things are done in these societies, and so therefore that's how we have to act too. It's the culture. I can tell you from my research that culture, quote unquote, was very significantly influenced by imperialism over the past century and a half which really disrupted uh, the indigenous cultural networks. And so what we're seeing now is not this, this long-standing um, you know, indigenous tribalism that's always been there and we have to play by the tribal rules. What we're seeing is tribalism that was very much distorted by external actors deciding to work through patronage networks with warlords and um, uh, elevating them in a way that didn't fit what the traditional cultures meant. So I'll stop there. Great. Um, Professor Fortna? Thanks. Um, gotta disrupt the floral arrangement to move the microwave. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, a couple, a uh, couple of things in response. First, um, um, in response to Stuart's comment just now about the FTO State Department list, um, I think that list is extremely problematic to use for any empirical uh, research. It's first of all, if you look closely at the State Department definition of terrorism, it's basically the use of violence. The illegal use of violence, anything that is violent and, and threatening could be put under that. And then there's the second piece of it that uh, harms or threatens us or our friends. So it's, it's, you know, it's very politicized, it's very subjective. So to use that list as kind of your list of organizations, is, it doesn't surprise me that that list has a high proportion of uh, Islamic groups. That's who we think our, our enemies are, right? Um, I have a question for Austin. Um, the strategy that you yeah, you propose is maybe the least bad option um, going forward in Afghanistan of leaving six to twenty five thousand troops. Um, can you say a little bit about what what that means in terms of the shadow of the future, the thinking of um, the Taliban and other groups 
now about if that if that's what's going to happen, how are they going to react to that? Does that allow them then to get the whole pie? We have a much reduced presence, and so they can then fight us more effectively, and out we go. It's just a little bit bloodier than if we go down to zero. Um, or is that actually going to deter that? In terms of sort of thinking about their whether they're going to get a part of the pie or, or the whole pie and when that might happen. Um, and then, um, that, and just sort of general kind of, not quite debate, but kind of out there about how, um, how negotiable are the aims of Al-Qaeda? Is this a, a group with um, sort of total goal, the, the establishment of the caliphate and global, the global network, and these, you know, it's very extreme, they, they, and there's no way of negotiating with that. I wouldn't necessarily contest that, but I would just put it in perspective by saying those on the receiving end of terrorism always think that about the group that, they're, that is attacking them. And there are cases where, um, where groups end up uh, negotiating a deal, so uh, you shouldn't necessarily take people's, you know, first opening bid in a, in terms of their statement of political goals as the only thing that they would ever accept. Um, so I'll stop. That. Okay, Professor Cooley. Yeah, thanks. This is really, really rich and really stimulating. Uh, Paige took my response to this issue of blacklisting. I think it's important um, to sort of view the process of blacklisting as an inherently political one. Uh, and, 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 and to just contextualize it. Yes, it can be used um, for some, um, you know, as some indications, but, but the way the sausage is made, if you look at the deals that are done and the trade-offs and so forth, says a lot more about coalition building dynamics, I think, than sort of objective indicators of who's, uh, who's a terrorist or not. I, just a very minor point, because uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the pre presentations, but, but I think it's important for the historical record. On the whole business of Spain in 2004, let's not forget why Aznar lost this election. He lost this election because he went to bat very publicly and said this was the work of ETA as soon as the bombings unfolded. He called up every major newspaper and gave them his word that he knew for a fact that this was the work of ETA. So it is not surprising at all that he was punished at the polls for this, right? So before we get into sort of the Spanish, I'm not saying anyone on this panel was saying this, but there was this meme that somehow the Spanish were appeasing terrorists and Al-Qaeda and so forth. The domestic political context, I think, was uh, pretty, uh, pretty compelling in terms of an anti asnar backlash. And Zapatero, yes, withdrew troops from Iraq. It was in his campaign platform, but he also preserved basing rights for OIF, uh, unlike say, the lack of Spanish support for things like Libya in 1986 or so forth. So, so this wasn't a complete withdrawal from coalition. It was a withdrawal of actual uh, Spanish forces. Uh, just one other brief point following on some of Austin's presentation. Um, you know, it's become very fashionable, especially amongst the Obama administration, now to talk about the need for a regional solution in Afghanistan. And we're going to convene a big conference in Chicago. NATO is in the spring to sort of talk about the contours of this. And just some of the background that Austin gave, I think, shows how difficult, in fact, putting together a regional solution is going to be, not only because countries have different sort of preferences and agendas, but there are at least two countries that border Afghanistan uh, that don't really want to see a stable functioning uh, Afghanistan in some ways, or certain elements don't. And, and Pakistan uh, is one. Uh, Tajikistan is the other. Tajikistan benefits inordinately from the drug trade. This is uh, over, uh, this double drug, drug trade from Afghanistan doubles its GDP. The idea that somehow, um, you know, the Tajik government would ever be uh, on board some sort of, uh, you know, real serious international sort of counter-narcotics effort um, is, 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 is debatable. So, you know, regional solutions, this sounds really good, and you would think everyone has an interest in sort of a stable Afghanistan, but in practice, it's going to be um, really incredibly difficult. Plus, I'll, I'll give you one more analogy in terms of the, the diplomatic legwork here. Um, remember uh, the Madrid conference after the Gulf War, right, and the attempts to finally have Arabs and Israelis down to the, you know, settlement table and so forth? You know, James Baker back then made dozens of trips to Syria, to Saudi Arabia. I mean, he was tireless. I mean, never thought he'd be sort of extolling the virtues of Jim Baker. Uh, in, in, in preparing the groundwork for this, right? And so I don't see nearly the same level of shuttling of engagement. It's just 
more put out there as an aspiration, really, uh, than an actual sort of concrete plan. But that's a complete gratuitous aside that I think was inspired by some of um, um, uh, Austin's point on the regional situation. Okay, um, Professor Long. Fortunately, I like to fight. <laughs> uh, but, but first, nice things about my fellow panelists. Um, Kim, I thought that was a great overview. I mean, even though I engage with a lot of that literature too, I hope this comes out as maybe a review essay or something. I mean, it's just really great overview of where social science has come in the, in the decade. Um, same thing with Alex, you know, I'm, I'm not nearly as deep on a lot of these issues as you are, but uh, I learned a lot just from that, that presentation. And I, I thought really the most interesting piece was, was pages. Um, that was some, some really fascinating findings. Um, you know, even from somebody that, that looks a lot at civil war and insurgency to, to sort of find those conclusions. That was great. All right, now on to the <laughs> festivities. Um, so, Stuart, um, you know, I'm sorry that I, I'm not properly deferential to Secretary Gates. Um, Bob Jervis would probably say that if I disagree with, with uh, Bob Gates, I'm, I'm actually probably right, just based on that as the sole indicator. Um, I think, you know, 60 years ago, you know, you might have been saying the same thing. Oh, a communist is a communist is a communist. Well, they weren't. With a Sino-Soviet split, I mean, ad nauseum. The same is true of these groups. Yes, they share an ideology. That does not mean they are indistinguishable. Yes, they will share techniques. They will share a variety of, uh, of things. But their goals are different. There have been zero Haqqani network attacks inside Pakistan. There have been zero Haqqani network attacks inside the United States. There have been zero Haqqani network attacks anywhere really but Afghanistan. Is that because the Haqqani network is incapable? No, it's extraordinarily capable. Uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that somehow they're, they're indistinguishable from Al-Qaeda. So I take your point that you have to take the ideology seriously, but uh, if, if you're gonna fight every Islamic extremist with a gun, you know, buckle down kids, because we're in for a rough ride. I mean, there are a lot of Islamic extremists. They are not all inherently major national security risks to the United States. Um, Hezbollah right now is, you know, could potentially be a, a major opponent of the United States. They have, by and large, chosen not to be. I mean, they oppose some of our regional interests um, and will occasionally poke us in the eye, but Hezbollah has not attempted to launch attacks on the U.S. homeland. Um, so to conflate all, even Sunni extremists, I think is... Uh, is looking for more enemies than we need to. And I say that as somebody who, you know, attempts have been made in my life by at least four different Islamic extremist groups, uh, all for very different, if somewhat related reasons. Um, Kim, dismissive of benefits for the, for, for, um, of being in Afghanistan for Pakistan nukes. I think there's some benefit. Clearly, I do believe the United States should retain some presence in Afghanistan, but you know, even at the unclassified New York Times level, um, you know, Raymond Davis, uh, the former Special Forces, later CIA contractor that was arrested in Lahore, I mean, he was based at the consulate there. I mean, we have an active intelligence collection effort inside Pakistan. Um, and you're, you're going to have a much easier time figuring out what's going on at Kahuta from Islamabad or Lahore or Karachi than you are from Jalalabad or Bagram. So, uh, while I think that you know there is some goodness there, the, the majority of our collection against Pakistan is gonna come from inside Pakistan. Um, on the the corruption patronage issue, I think this just reflects our our different sort of viewpoints on what the U.S. interests in Afghanistan is slash are. Um, I, I I totally concede that in the in the long term, if you're really concerned about building a, a sort of Weberian state um, that will provide security. You know, patronage is not your friend. I mean, we came out of the Tammany Hall systems for a reason. Um, I just don't really care that much about stability in Afghanistan, except as it relates to those two goals that were laid out. And I believe the United States can achieve those goals. Yes, patronage is unstable, but you can always find a new patron. Yes, people will be excluded, but you just have to find enough partners uh, to ensure that, that the situation is you know, shall we say meta-stable, right? You don't have to make everyone happy. You just have to make enough people happy to keep the others in line. If this is a remarkably cold-blooded view of the world, you know, it, it comes from someone who has seen the cost and blood and treasure to the United States of actions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I would rather work through warlords knowing the cost of that 
um, than the alternative. And you know, amplifying that, you know, you mentioned culture and imperialism. I, I mean, I, I take your point. There's nothing inherent in any of these cultures, in either Iraq or Afghanistan, that means they are they're doomed to this system. But the thing to remember about Afghanistan is it's a rentier state, right? All of its resources come from outside the state itself. Um, in most rentier states, it's from natural resources. In Afghanistan, it is from us. In rural Afghanistan, there is no tax collection. Therefore, if there is no external aid budget, there is no government. So we are inherently, in some sense, in the business of patronage just because there is no alternative. Um, and I would rather we just sort of own up to that and try and move towards functional patronage rather than dysfunctional patronage. Because you're right, a lot of this is driven by the, the unwillingness to share the wealth. And as you know, you're right, sharing the wealth doesn't mean everybody gets some, but prominent players are excluded. And that's a real problem. So we have to we have to expand the patronage networks at least sufficiently to ensure that you know that those that are important get a taste in a way that they currently aren't. Um, page strategy. Um, in terms of shadow of the future, I think it actually helps if you can say to the Taliban um, and, and various affiliated groups, hey, the United States is going to be here as long as it takes. Um, we'll be in a less presence, um, but we're not going away. Because right now the expectation is, you know, I know zero is not zero, but everybody else doesn't, right? They believe zero is actually zero. And who knows? Depending on the elections and the economy, zero really could be zero. I think that would be bad, as I outlined. Um, but what happens if we go to the smaller footprint? We're going to probably lose most of the Pashtun areas. Um, but remember, we intervened in support of a civil, uh, one side in a civil war that held 10% of the country and rapidly gave them all of the country. Um, that, that group still exists in one form or another and is still armed in one form or another. And in fact, they make up a lot of the uh, of, the, of the Afghan military. So if the civil war becomes you know, completely apparent to the naked eye, uh, I think we can easily ensure that at least 60% of the country, which you know, perhaps not coincidentally is the non-Pashtun part of the population, can be held. And we can achieve the goals in terms of Al-Qaeda um, and also the goals in terms of Pakistan with that, with that 60%. Now, the advantage you get from the shadow of the future is if you can say credibly, look, we're not going to have 100,000 guys here, but we're going to have 5,000 guys, 10,000 guys, 15,000 guys, and they're all going to be beating you about the head and shoulders and providing air support and medevac and all this to you know, a still capable Afghan military and conducting counterterrorism operations. Then maybe, and, and by the way, because we've reduced our, our footprint, we can now do this indefinitely. Right? How many people know how many troops are in Iraq right now? Raise your hand. Yeah, this is my point. Bob Jervis knows because he knows everything. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> other than, well, okay. <laughs> Nobody else knows. Why? Is it because the number is zero? No, the number is still about 40,000, actually closer to 50. Um, why don't we know that? Because it's off the front page. And as long as you get the numbers in Afghanistan off the front page, we can do this forever. I think that does start to change people's calculations. Thank you. Great. All right, so we'd like to invite people up for questions. Okay. So again, please introduce yourself. Oh, yes. Since the uh, United States has... Uh, Sorry, can you introduce yourself? Big pardon? Can you introduce yourself, please? T tell us who you are. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Bill Harris. I'm an alumnus. Not of this school here, yeah, one of the others here. Uh, yeah, since the United States now has uh, reestablished, uh, reinstated realism as its dominant, uh, you know, uh, policy activities and foreign policy, what effect will this have on, you know, the United States leaving Afghanistan since, you know, the basic conflict is the civil war? Let, let's gather maybe three yeah. at a time, and then we'll kind of distribute them and do another round. That sounds like a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I, I'm Abe Wagner. I'm a faculty member here at SEPA and a good friend of most of all of you. Uh, and Austin, we, we've had the discussion about Afghanistan uh, ad nauseum, and uh, I simply don't believe that the objectives you've set forth are you know, achievable at all, but that's not the actual question I want to ask. Uh, 
Uh, what I would like to draw you out on is what do you think about the decision-making process within the Taliban? Uh, how does it really function? I mean, you, you talked a little bit about it in your talk about what they're likely to do and objectives, but you know, what do we really understand about the nature of that decision process uh, and how it's likely to evolve in the future? Okay, okay I'll take one more. Hi, I'm Leanne Chung. I'm a graduate of the Columbia Engineering School about 20 years ago. And uh, I happen to be from Sarasota, Florida, where President Bush was on 9-11 with school children. And it's the same county where the lead terrorist attacker, Mohammed Atta, trained in flight school. So I was wondering if any of you panelists know if there's been any intelligence gathering on counterterrorism regarding Sarasota, Florida, or has there been any study regarding how the lives of terrorists their day-to-day -day operations were, you know, over the past 10 years, I've learned where Mohammed Atta allegedly worked, where he bought fish with his cousin, mm -hmm. you know, where he shopped at Home Depot. I was just wondering mm -hmm. if uh, Sarasota has been in the limelight with any counterterrorism studies. Thank you. Okay. So, any volunteers to take a I could answer that for half a second, not necessarily about Sarasota, <laughs> Florida. Um, but the 9-11 commissioners, um, not everything that made it into the final report, but they did pretty in-depth analyses of these different actors. Um, there's a few other books out there I could talk to you after uh, that um, go through all of the different um, players of 9-11, and when, not just in the days and weeks before the attack, but how they came to the, into the country, what they were doing, why they were in Florida. Um, like Andrew Card, things like that. Andrew, why Andrew Card was in Florida? Well, he was there with the president. Well, he was the chief, yeah, the chief of staff. They, they were going somewhere else. They were, had a bunch of events that he was with them on, on uh, Air Force One. But in terms of why Otto was there, um, and maybe why counterterrorism wasn't, um, would be explained in the 9-11 Commission uh, report, or at least it goes into some of that stuff. I don't know anything about Sarasota, Florida, but I'm originally from Minnesota, and one of the striking things that's been happening there is the Shabab um, mm -hmm. that's fighting in Somalia, including terrorist attacks against civilians. Um, young uh, Somalis who uh, emigrated to the United States are now going back, and they're coming out of Minnesota. So the whole question of um, uh, you know what is happening in the United States that is creating a situation that that causes people to want to, c to commit acts of terrorism, I think, is still very relevant. Um, I just wanted to to quickly say uh, one thing in regard. To uh, to what Austin said, because we'll keep on debating this. But off the top of my head, I can think of three cases um, where U.S. security interests have been harmed by our previous support of uh, um, uh, patronage. One is Egypt, uh, where uh, the Egyptian military was uh, played a very positive role uh, in the Arab Spring, but now there is a, a great concern about whether one of our strongest allies in the Middle East is going to be undercut by the fact that the population really resents the patronage that is practiced by the Egyptian military um, and that they might blame the United States for that. Um, the second is a case that Alex Cooley has done a lot of work on, and that's uh, the Kyrgyzstan case uh, in 2010 when there was uh, an overthrow of the existing government. One of the big issues was resentment um, over the patronage that was practiced by the U.S. military base um, located in Manas, which is crucial for our operations in Afghanistan. Um, and the third is that there's a lot of evidence that the kind of uh, violence that's now occurring in Iraq again um, includes violence among members of the Sons of Iraq and their followers who are disagreeing about the distribution of the spoils um, now that the United States is no longer there to really play any role in dampening down their conflicts. So I think um, we can't ignore long-term interests that the U.S. has in security even if we have to focus on these short-term interests too. Okay, um, <laughs> sure. Uh, the return of realism to the U.S. foreign policy is a consummation devoutly to be wished, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, the, the intervention in Libya, uh, you know, we sort of tried to keep our hands off of it, but we were, we were certainly hanging out in the background. Um, as I alluded to, uh, our strategy in Afghanistan is still a bit confused about what we're actually up to. Um, so I think we, we might have become somewhat more realistic, but I would not say we have embraced a fully realist, realist foreign policy. Um, but, you know, that's okay. We're America. We can, we can get by with mixing a little idealism here, realism here. Um, what are the implications uh, for withdrawal for, from uh, Afghanistan? Look, we're going to continue to support the Afghan state. Um, you know, and it, there are Pashtun elements to it. There are Tajik, Uzbek, and Hazara elements to it. Um, at a minimum, you know, we'll hold the parts that are non-Pashtun. But look, even, though, even Pashtuns, there's plenty of, of Pashtun supporters of the United States 
principally for reasons of patronage, but that's, you know, that's sort of how it works in, in a lot of these cases. Um, Taliban decision making. As I said, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of groups, but one thing to bear in mind, um, despite in some sense our best efforts targeting Taliban mid-level leadership, it's, you know, the different groups are still pretty coherent. Um, you know, there is a, a, an inner shura of the Quetta Shura Taliban that makes decisions. Now, are they implemented with absolute fidelity on the ground everywhere in Afghanistan? No, but they do have a lot of say. Um, now, there's infighting that happens, but it, it's pretty minimal. The Haqqani network, as far as I could tell, is extraordinarily disciplined. And I think as soon as Siraj Haqqani decides he's happy with whatever settlement, we could turn the music or he could turn the music off. Um, same with his Islamic Obudin. It's in infamous for its massive levels of discipline that may have eroded slightly over the past 30 years, but it's still a pretty disciplined organization. And my impression is that, that IMU is, is pretty similar. So these are, you know, they're decentralized in the sense that um, the Wehrmacht was, was decentralized in World War II, right? People get a lot of mission type orders to go figure out how to do something. But decentralized is not the same as. Uh, a, an, a, collect, a collective of autonomous entities. So I think that there is you know, enough central decision making to hold these organizations together. If, again, for no other reason that resources flow both ways, up and down the chain of command, and if you start you know, dis disobeying, then there are a variety of sanctions, including having resources cut off, or maybe your head cut off, that can be imposed upon you by the, by the senior leadership, potentially. Um, yeah, on, on Kim's point, I mean, Iraq, look, there's, there's, there is, there's always going to you know, be the potential for issues with patronage, but I, I question whether Iraq would be better off had we, never, had we never undertaken the patronage that we did. I mean, there would still be resource distribution issues uh, inside Iraq. There would have been resource distribution issues inside Egypt. Um, and look, we, we got a substantial benefit for more than three decades from our patronage relationship with the Egyptians. I mean, at some point, you know, e everything's going to change, but I think three decades is, is, is a pretty good, you know, amount of time. On the, on the, on the CT uh, inside the United States, I mean, you can look no further than the creation of the Intelligence Division of the New York Police Department um, as a major counterterrorism um, innovation that has been you know, controversial but pretty effective. So, I mean, there's, there, there have been substantial efforts to, to sort of develop uh, this, this kind of apparatus. Okay, Sarah. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Khan. Um, I'm a student here at the Political Science Department. Um, my question is for Professor Cooley. Um, you mentioned in the second part of your presentation a tendency on part of uh, Russia and China to codify actions mm -hmm. being carried out um, in the name of counterterrorism, whereas um, the U.S. has engaged in a lot of outsourcing both geographically mm -hmm. as with Guantanamo and by way of actors, mm -hmm. so outsourcing to contractors. Um, mm -hmm. My question is what would you say explains this variation in mm -hmm. response mm -hmm. and does it say more about the nature and mm -hmm. extent of the actions being carried out or does it reflect more about the difference in these countries and how they um, negotiate international law and norms. Right. Interesting. Want to take one? Mm -hmm. yes. Hi. <coughs> My name is Andrea Pesaurus, and I'm a local bank analyst, and I'd been a student at Columbia back in the 80s. Um, Mr. Long, you made an interesting um, parallel or comparison with the Wehrmacht, because I'm curious about the um, growing um, or the more apparent German hegemony, hegemony that um, has perhaps become a little more powerful now that they're fully funded East Germany and the reunification of it has enabled um, Germany to um, be more comfortable to engage internationally, militaristically than um, it had in, um, so it's more evident. And I, I see this and I hear this. And um, so what are thoughts about that? And it's been sort of an obscured actor um, behind the scenes but has enjoyed um, riding on the coattails of the United States with regard to um, um, the facility of Cold War between, which had been a German policy because it was um, Kaiser Germany policy to use to keep Germany co constantly on war footing. 
um, while it was consolidating. So what's the, um, what observations with regard to, and, and, Dr. and Mr. Cooley also, you know, talked about the indirect, there are indirect um, or obscure participants in this or count parties enjoying um, that other people take the flack um, whereas um, they themselves will be benefactors. And my concern also is with regard to um, where commercial war really is mm -hmm. the issue. So what are your thoughts that um, many of these um, um, protagonists and terrorists and rebels um, are really for commercial purposes because when you understand what the Fourth Reich has been doing and who and what they are and their commercial and cultural war and where we've just, to the degree that we've sort of been um, so totally co-opted by those interests and mm -hmm. have just really failed to clean up those problems here in the United States and mm -hmm. as a result it just spreads about the world suiting the purposes of um, commercial and cultural war for um, the, the elite and the commercial powers. Mm -hmm. So if you could speak to those two issues. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. One more. Thank you. Um, my name is Ben Todeshek. I am a student at SIPA studying international security policy and human rights because I'm about to change. Um, <laughs> and I was Wait, which, way, which way are you going? <laughs> <laughs> Just like I'm not going to assign names to the arguments I'm about to sum up. I don't want to uh, assign myself a, a label. <laughs> um, I'll tell you after. Um, but uh, I, I I guess my question pertains to what is the root cause of terrorism, which is probably the central uh, question of this panel and a lot of the op-eds coming out 10 years after the attacks. Um, this is by far the best and most rich source of information I've seen anywhere uh, in the ether, so thank you guys so much. Uh, I, I guess like I've seen three basic strands. One is that, um, the, the, the type of terrorism that we're mainly concerned about today is Islamic, uh, Islamist rather. Um, and then I, I sort of sensed the majority of the panelists disagreeing with that. Um, uh, one argument was that um, it comes from political uh, inequality or lack of um, political representation. Um, but if we accept uh, Professor Fortna's definition of terrorism, then it appears that it's um, a plurality of different issues, um, one of which is democracy, the presence of a democracy. Um, of course, the state where the terrorism originates doesn't have to be democratic. I know that you're, you're talking about the state that actually gets attacked and for transnational terrorism. Um, the, the democracy in the state wouldn't necessarily cause terrorism to occur. Um, but I, I still think that there's a tension between this issue of political representation, and maybe I'm wrong, and um, the fact that democracies are um, sort of a magnet for uh, this symbolic um, form of political violence that can um, uh, that can pr um, propel a, a population that receives pain to act uh, in the interests of the terrorists. And um, I even think that Professor uh, Fortin is finding that um, half as many, uh, half as much of the time political uh, terrorist organizations reach a negotiated settlement um, is sort of interesting in the sense that um, there seems to be some kind of just success story there. It's not quite clear to me, what um, is the cause of terrorism? Is it self-interested? Is it, um, I wanna finish with, uh, maybe this will clear up my questions. The, the um, Arab Spring, um, some have argued was caused by inequality. Um, but uh, one professor at Barnard, uh, Professor, um, oh man, blanking on her name, um, I never got to take her, she argues that uh, there, the political inequality actually caused the uprising in Egypt, um, which obviously was nonviolent. And so I was just wondering if like, anybody wants to jump uh, to the front and um, sort of like sum up where the debate is on what the root cause of terrorism actually is. And I'm sorry if I sort of botched up my understanding of the <laughs> arguments. Thanks. Okay, we'll uh, take another round of responses. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Mitzak. Yeah. Um, first of all, on the, on the question of uh, Islamist terrorism, uh, Steve Fish has a new book, Stephen Fish from the University of California at Berkeley has a new book out, and I'm blanking out on the exact title, but he goes through a huge amount of statistical data on the question of whether around the world people who profess Islam as a religion are any different from people who profess other religions. Um, and one of his findings are that, um, in fact, 75% of terrorist attacks that have happened in the past 10 years have been conducted by people who explicitly considered themselves to be acting on behalf of Islamism. In other words, of trying to replace an existing government um, with a, a government that was under a particular um, uh, Muslim uh, 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 influenced uh, uh, kind of government. Um, but that um, uh, more than half of those have been um, committed within the countries where they, uh, the people who committed the acts of terrorism were based, and so this goes back again to the lo locality of the issue, um, and that in fact um, Muslims as a whole do not support the idea of um, uh, violent solutions to political actions or, or to um, replacing uh, existing governments with, uh, is, with people who follow their own religion any more than any other religious people do. And so it, it, it sort of is, is you know, the, the data go in one direction but not in the other direction. Obviously the vast majority of those terrorist attacks probably occurred on the ground in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and we can all think of other places in the world where um, people who were explicitly Islamist were conducting uh, attacks that were probably based on um, political inequality um, uh, measures like Chechnya, for example, in Russia. Um, and uh, one other thing to think about in terms of religion is that it provides a sense of personal networks um, that might reinforce um, the way that, that um, uh, people approach things. And one of the things that's been tried in um, some European mosques is to, to see if uh, a, a sentiment of solving problems through nonviolent means um, is something that would prevent people who might be Islamist in their orientation to think about peaceful mechanisms to get Islamist solutions. Um, just wanted to say in passing to answer once more this debate that I'm having with, with Austin, um, that just because something worked for 30 years didn't mean it was the best solution that could be tried, um, and that I'm uh, going to be uh, advising a SEPA course in spring semester that will look at the problem of corruption along the Northern Supply Network going into Afghanistan and whether there's a solution. I just want to add one thing to the Al-Qaeda and Islam um, issue. Uh, it's not just the religion of Islam, obviously. Uh, I, I want to point out that, that Anders Breivik, the Norway shooter, I think is a good example yeah. of something very similar to what we've seen with the Al-Qaeda movement over the last mm -hmm. few decades, and you could really go back centuries if you wanted to, but the ideological foundations of the particular movement uh, based on certain, what they would say, political grievances and historical uh, evolutions and uh, uh, illegitimate leaders not representing their culture anymore and things like that. Um, if you have some spare time, you should leaf through uh, Breivik's 1,500-page manifesto uh, about uh, global civilizational revolutionary war, uh, pitting the West against what he calls, quote, Islamic cultural imperialism. Um, it was a virtual mirror image of the manifestos emanating from Ayman al-Zawari and, and uh, Anwar al-Awlaki and other al-Qaeda ideologues. Um, so we have to Remember, it's a combination of forces. It's a combination of, of a culture that, or certain representatives of a culture um, that feel aggrieved and are, and are willing to use violence against historical forces, forces that they think are working against them. Um, but just like, and I, would, I, dis I still disagree a little bit on the international and domestic nexus. I don't want to go too much into it, but uh, if we have individuals like Major Hassan who, who you know, did the shooting at Fort Hood. Uh, he was an American citizen that, that committed a domestic act of terrorism, but he was clearly motivated by international and global concerns and radicalized uh, internationally from Amar al himself. So in terms of political science, how we categorize that, if that's gonna be categorized as a domestic attack and part of a, you know, a, a matrix of, uh, of this is another domestic attack, so most attacks are domestic and not international, I think it's very fuzzy uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and the same thing for Breivik, because he, he says, I'm, I'm Norwegian, but I'm not we Norwegian. I'm European, I'm Western. Um, and so I think it's very interesting. And it could uh, hopefully, you know, not uh, uh, expand and bring, you know, more into that, into that cause. But hopefully that's the end of it, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the question about what explains these different sort of frameworks for um, these sort of counterterrorism efforts and sort of erosion of, 
human rights norms um, is a very good one. I don't think I have an answer to it. But I would caution against the simple norm story here for a couple of reasons. One, on the China case, China, contrary to sort of this original prevailing wisdom that there's a Beijing consensus and supports authoritarian norms and so forth, China, in, in, in my view anyway, uh, tends to calibrate the prevailing norms of each region that it deals with, right? And so this is why you saw China pretty much stand out of the way in the Arab Spring, right? Um, uh, and similarly in Central Asia, I think it's calibrating to a level that it feels comfortable with and necessary to secure its support on the question of Uyghur sort of separatism. Russia's tricky, right? Because on the one hand, you would say, um, you know, a regime led by pres you know, President Putin for most of this time, maybe still led by pres Prime Minister Putin, um, oh, is so antithetical to sort of Western norms, human rights norms, and yet, and yet, of the three countries that all engaged in extraordinary renditions, Russia is the only one to pull them back in response to international pressure. And why is that? Because it's a member of the European Court of Human Rights. So there are several cases where the European Court of Human Rights has actually stayed uh, Russian actions in terms of some of these renditions. And the most famous case is the Ivanovo case of 14 Uzbeks living in Russia that were demanded by the government of Uzbekistan in conjunction or in relation to what they were doing in Andijan. Uh, and uh, the Russian government heeded uh, the warning by the European court. Hasn't done so in all cases, but I think of the three, they are the most susceptible to international normative pressure. So, so, so the norms question and story, I think, is a very intriguing one, but, 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 but really tricky. I don't think there's a direct kind of route there. There might be a Cir no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a circular route there, but maybe it's one that you can uh, sort of you know, find out and, and enlighten us on. Um, on the question of sort of the industry behind this and the economic incentives and so forth, also uh, tricky. All, Austin's obviously the stats guy, so I'll defer to him on the exact multiple now of US combat troops in Iraq to contractors. I don't know if it's 516171. Uh, when the conflict began, um, you know, contractors were a fraction of combat troops, and now that, that's the reverse. And you see this trend um, throughout the world. You, you, but you also see it, um, especially in the area of uh, intelligence and counterintelligence, the outsourcing of a lot of intelligence activities um, to the private sector. And I think you've seen a lot of this in Central Asia. Um, the commercialization of incentives, uh, it, uh, Kim alluded to this in the end. I mean, what, 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 what always sort of intrigues me about the sort of Central Asia, post-Soviet Central Asia, Afghanistan comparison is sort of behind the curtain of what we're trying to do in Afghanistan, we have institutionalized a whole set of patrimonial arrangements to try and secure Central Asian state support um, for uh, logistical uh, cooperation with what's going on in Afghanistan. And in fact, General Petraeus waived standard contracting regulations because he wanted to encourage the US military to buy local for some of Central Asian countries and offer them economic incentives um, to engage. Now, people say, no, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do if you're trying to get this cooperation. As Austin said, it's pick your poison. It's Pakistan or Russia and Central Asia. Um, but there is a kind of a behind the curtains kind of dynamic going on where officially we're combating corruption in Afghanistan and then we're sort of I would say even institutionalizing it through some of our practices um, uh, in Central Asia. Um, so yes, there is a lot of money to be made this effort. Sometimes it's the strategy to gain cooperation for this effort. But as long as Afghanistan is the compelling strategic goal, policymakers will tell you um, it's, 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 it's part of what we need to do. You know, my final point on this would be uh, I can accept that argument, but only if then we sort of list these arrangements on uh, the negative side of the ledger of the cost of Afghanistan, right? Saying, by pursuing Afghanistan, we're doing this in Uzbekistan. We're doing this with the Tajiks, with the Kyrgyz, the Bakiyevs, or whatever. It's a cost of Afghanistan, as opposed to sort of dancing around it a little bit and trying to massage what we're doing. If we're clear on what the ledger is, I think maybe that also helps us make more uh, informed calculations. So I'll just leave it at that. Professor um, so I 
I have a comment that addresses this issue of, of Islam and terrorism, but then it relates to a more general point that I think gets to some of your question, uh, Ben, about, um, about political inequality and terrorism. So, um, Kim, if I heard you right, uh, Fish is saying that 75% of those individuals who've committed a terrorist attack are uh, Muslim. Or claiming no, it's not that they're Muslim. It's that they have explicitly stated Islamist. that their goal is Goals. Islamist. Okay. So that so they want to replace a current government with a uh, okay. Muslim government. Okay. okay. So I mean, one issue is is whether Fish is working off the State Department FTO list. In which case, we can just no, throw this. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that's the same premise behind the ones that I. Right, but okay, but but the broader Steve the broader is point is that the Islamic world has been the site of political contention of all forms lately, right? So if you counted the percentage of peaceful protesters who come from the Islamic world um, in the last year, it would be extraordinarily high given the Arab Spring, right? So I think, that, but the broader point is that we need to distinguish between what are the causes of uh, political grievance and contestation and organization to try to change things, and then what are the causes of those things turning violent? And this is gonna to get to the point about democracy. And then what are the causes of that turning to terrorism, right? So on the democracy or the political opportunity um, point, democracies are much, much less likely to experience a civil war because there are other political outlets for changing the system or for expressing grievance. But if they have a civil war, they're much more likely to have that turn to terrorism because terrorism is more effective against democracies and against non democracies So I think in, in separating these things, and if, if we're talking about the root cause of terrorism, well, first of all, do you mean the root cause of contestation? Do you mean the root cause of violence? Do you mean the root cause, given those things, of terrorism? So I think that a lot of these kind of findings in the literature and, and you know all this stuff, that distinction needs really to be made clearly, and it generally isn't made clearly. Well, I mean, that, that does bring up the question, though. The point was Islamists, not from the Muslim world, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and that is a, that is a distinction. Um, I don't know the you know, no efficient data well enough, but I do sometimes get a little concerned. I mean, we have to distinguish between what is social science and what is sort of U.S. policy interest. The vast majority of terrorists may not be Islamist. The, the ones of most you know, sort of salience to attacks on the U.S. homeland, at least at the present time, do appear to be. So I, I worry that we sort of dance around that a little too much at times and say, ah, in the broad universe of things, as, you know, Islam does not show up as any different. And it probably doesn't, but you know, in the present context, um, you know, the, the Norwegian lunatics of the world are not lining up to come over here, at least at yet. I mean, you know, give it time. Um, on the question of Germany, Germany is still intensely uncomfortable with the use of force. They are actually the, well, maybe not right now, I'd have to look, but they're roughly the third largest troop contributor to the effort in Afghanistan. They may actually be second, but they have a lot of what are called national caveats on how they exercise the use of force. And there's a strong argument that parts of northern Afghanistan have gotten less stable despite being you know, majority Tajik and, and should be fairly inhospitable to the Taliban, in part because the Germans have not done such a great job of, of handling that region. And in fact, the Germans have scrupulously avoided acknowledging that they're in a war, right? They don't call it counterinsurgency to the extent that they can help it. There really isn't a German word for counterinsurgency, at least I'm told, I'm not a German speaker myself. Um, so, you know, the, the, the attitude about military force, yeah, it's different than it was, say, 30 years ago, but I, I don't see a Germany that is going to spring onto the world stage and begin throwing its, its military weight around. Economic weight, you know, is, is different. Clearly, of, of all the European countries, they've, they've weathered the late unpleasantness uh, best and therefore, in a sense, in the driver's seat, but it's maybe not a great driver's seat to be in. It's sort of the Thomas Schelling-esque, you've thrown the steering wheel out and tied yourself to the car, situation in terms of they've lashed themselves to, to the Euro and, and to Europe in, in ways that German taxpayers are now finding to maybe not have been the best idea in the world. So, uh, so uh, both Professor Fortna and Professor um, Martin wanted to jump in briefly and then we'll take the next round of questions. So uh, just in response to that, I, I certainly agree that there's a you know, difference between kind of terrorism globally and terrorism that the U.S. happens to care about the most at the moment. Um, I think the thing that's important to distinguish, though, is 
is if, if the terrorism that the U.S. cares about at the moment is predominantly or overwhelmingly Islamist, is that something to do with Islam and Islamicism, or is that something to do with where the U.S. is involved in the world and foreign policy interests and, and where those policies are most controversial, controversial in the countries, um, domestically within those countries. So I think, I think there's kind of a quick, um, not so much within academia, maybe a little bit more in the popular press, but, but more just kind of in the kind of general person's understanding of things, that if a terrorist is Islamist, it must have something to do with Islam. And uh, I think that's highly questionable. No, I don't think that that's what you're saying. No. I just want to quickly remind us all that social science deals with broad patterns and with probabilistic statements about how things are related to each other and is not very good at making point predictions and certainly can never say anything about a lone wolf or a Norwegian crazy person um, as acting. So. Okay, please. Yeah, I'm from Shanghai International Studies University and was granted as the Fulbright visiting uh, research uh, hosted at East Asia, uh, Weatherhead East Asia Institute. And 10 years ago, I was in New York and experienced the September 11th personally. I was working in Chinese Consulate General in New York. And I remembered after the September 11th, there was a broad uh, question raised nationwide, why do they hate us? Yes, it uh, forces us to rethink about the U.S. foreign policy, the U.S. public diplomacy, as well as the U.S. images overseas, especially in the Middle East, and also arouse us enough attention to those non-traditional security factors. So today, I was impressed by the presentation given by Professor Martin and give the analysis of terrorism with social science perspective. And my question is quite general. After 10 years anti-terrorism, how to evaluate US present security situations nationwide and worldwide? Even better or even worse? <laughs> it seems these days a lot of arguments involved. And my second question specific goes to Professor Coley. Uh, maybe there's Professor's points there that anti-terrorism is a kind of civil war. But I think it needs the new international uh, regime, uh, regime design. Mm -hmm. And you have mm -hmm. already mentioned the China-Russian cooperation, yep. or to some extent, China-US cooperation. My question is, do you think it, the possibilities uh, sometime in the future, maybe some triangle pre-aliens or cooperations among the three powers, US, China, and Russian? Thank you. Hi, my name is Jordan Brensinger, and I'm a current Master of International Affairs student here at SIPA. Um, I thank you all for your contribution to the panel. I, this is a relatively new, security in particular is a relatively new field for me. Um, in reflecting on the past 10 years since 9-11, and having spent uh, a number of those years abroad, I am particularly interested in the degeneration of the American image that I've witnessed while spending time overseas and how that's affected me as an, uh, as an American individual. Uh, as a development uh, practitioner, I'm interested in knowing whether or not that is an irreversible trend. If not, how can we understand particularly international cooperation um, both between countries and also across sectors like security and development? Hi, my name is uh, Aaron Penguin. I'm a second year uh, ISP student here at SIPA. Um, and I just want to hear a little bit more about the panel's thoughts about our current domestic capacity and performance in regards to terrorist threats. Um, what is the state of the Department of Homeland Security and the resulting policies of the Patriot Act? And um, are there areas for reform that we should be looking forward in the next few, few years? Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad that we've gotten beyond the why do they hate us discussion, um, partly because I think the they was really vague, and partly because I think hate was um, not really the right term to use in, in talking about what was motivating what was going on. So I'm glad we're beyond that too. Um, in terms of where we are now compared to where we are then, um, including on domestic security, but also on international security questions, I think the U.S. has learned 
And I think that all of the research that has been done on causes of terrorism has actually helped the U.S. to learn. Yes, we did do renditions. As far as I know, we don't do them uh, the, anymore, or at least if, if we don't do them, if we do do them now, it's, it's tiny. Um, we did do torture. Um, the evidence that has been publicly released is that it wasn't very many people who were actually tortured. It was like a couple dozen at most, maybe even less than that. But the amount of international um, outrage that was caused by that, um, I think caused the U.S. to really rethink. That means um, everybody in the U.S., and I would just point out that most military officers never supported the idea of torture, um, that that was coming from the civilians in the Defense Department, not from the military. Um, and I think the big question about human rights and about the effect that um, policies will have on uh, justice and um, uh, political perceptions of whether the United States is fair or not and whether it contributes to um, political inequality and nastiness or not is now um, centering on a, on a question that it would be good if we could resolve the debate about numbers and that is do, don't, do drone strikes hit civilians? And um, obviously both sides have an incentive to release information that is misleading, but I would guess that that's where um, a lot of the um, political justice questions are hitting today. Oh yeah, um, on um, just, just very briefly, I think one of the things, I mean this wasn't directed at me, over the last 10 years that we see is an erosion of U.S. credibility, prestige, influence in Central Asia. Clearly, I mean if this is a microcosm of where the world is going, now that doesn't mean the U.S. hasn't been able to do what it wanted to do, right? Because the money, the security cooperation, right, all in the end worked, right? But it has come at a cost, and the cost is, I, some would call it sort of soft power, some would call it moral authority, whatever. If you just look at the latest batch of WikiLeak dumps or describing meetings between Karimov and Central Asian leaders, the first thing they say in every meeting is, oh, you're double standards. You torture, you do all this kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's a problem. I think the other aspect of this, though, beyond the credibility, is I think you're seeing this is an era where other countries now have mechanisms of influence that the U.S. exclusively used to monopolize and control. For instance, the provision of international public goods. Who's uh, the big actor building infrastructure in Central Asia? It's China, right? I mean, there's more money going into Chinese roads than the World Bank has ever allocated or so forth. So, 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 so I think it's slowly but steadily some of the functions that the U.S. used to play as sort of a hegemon are being eroded in, in these regions. And that's not necessarily bad for development. Um, I think you know, it, it's quite good that these roads are being built. Um, uh, but I think it's just another sort of signal of the difference now and sort of 10 years ago. Uh, on sort of the potential for US, Russia, China, uh, triangular cooperation, we had a conference about this in CSIS. Uh, I think it's really difficult. And part of, part of the reason it's difficult is not that we don't have certain common interests, is that triangle structure, they are inherently unstable, right? The two sides on the triangle are always looking to the third, right? And saying, oh my gosh, we've just been ganged up on, I'm going to forge this alliance. And you get this if you go to Moscow a little bit and you talk to analysts about sort of perceptions, you'll see, not, it's not an even split, but you will find people who say, gosh, you know, we're so concerned about China now, maybe we should have better relations with the West, right? And sort of, you know, uh, 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 balance against sort of China that's sort of looming and so forth. And, and, and so, uh, that's that's the different you know the, the difficult thing, and I think the sort of microcosm of what you saw in September 11th, sort of the Chinese pivoting, then the Russians pivoting, our concern about a potential you know Russian Chinese axis, I think just points to very the, the structural difficulties of of, of 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 doing that. But but uh, but certainly more institutionalized forms and and, and 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 dialogues can't be a bad thing. Can I add one quick thing to that? Yeah. Um, on the question, it also dovetails a little bit into the question of <coughs> America's. Um, uh, the view of the world uh, about America's, uh, you know, leadership and things like that. Um, there was a ton of cooperation after 9-11, yep. and there remains a lot of cooperation. I agree with you 100% on Russia and China. Um, it started in a popular way because the world united with, mm -hmm. the, with the United States after 9-11, but it evolved even after the Bush administration became very unpopular and a lot of the policies came out. Um, one of the little uh, known secrets is that most of the rest of the world continued to cooperate with the United States secretly, uh, including European countries that had, uh, you know, uh, 
just populations that, that were despising the United States at that particular point. Um, the story that has not yet been told is the amount of that cooperation, not just with Russia and China, which it's a little easier to understand, um, and they have their own domestic threats that they perceive as linked in with the, with the terrorist threats, uh, global terrorist threats. But the Europeans, that, that book hasn't been written yet, but the European countries, um, mm -hmm. and I could tell stories which we don't have time for, but one small one would be uh, in Italy, uh, there was a rendition of a, yep. of a sheikh um, in Milan, and uh, it was outrage all across Europe. Yeah. And years later, um, there was an indictment in Italy against the uh, 20, yeah. uh, CIA, yeah, roughly CIA 20 CIA agents, agents in absentia, um, and they did this big show trial, very symbolic and important to the Europeans to cleanse themselves and disassociate right. the Americans. And the further up they got uh, up the chain of command, they realized the director of military <laughs> intelligence knew about the rendition, yeah. and then the prime minister's office was, was brought into, into yeah. play, and then they stopped that part of the investigation right. and just kept it on the American CIA agents right. and kind of had these right. no. absentia prosecutions and felt no, good about it, themselves. It, yeah. it, it's, it's a very good point. And, you know, who signed off on all these sort of black sites and the air, you know, the landing rights for these refuels the and so did. forth? I mean, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as the chair um, at this point and uh, ask as kind of a summary question to bring it back to the, the, the overall theme of the panel. Um, 9-11 and what about, uh, you know, what have we learned, what do we know about the future? And I'm going to ask kind of a speculative question of, of the panel and give you each three minutes to respond, even though this is going to be tight. So um, David Singer of, of the New York Times right now is all over the news talking about the direct costs of 9-11 and the indirect costs. And he, he characterizes a lot of these indirect costs as costs of choice. Mm -hmm. So things that we as a country, as, a, as the U.S. government, uh, took on in response. And he's asking a lot of really <coughs> interesting, good questions about, you know, on the level of was it worth it, uh, were in some cases these costs that we've incurred, have they been counterproductive? And so I wanted to um, kind of throw out a scenario. So imagine there is another foreign-based Al-Qaeda attack. So we know it's Al-Qaeda, it's not off on any of these other um, groups. Um, and to make it a little more concrete, say it's a, um, an act of sabotage on a nuclear power plant also kills hundreds of Americans, very upsetting. What, if anything, might happen differently this time around? So given that we still have a lot of the same kind of political constraints that we had before, but we've ostensibly learned a lot. We've learned a lot through policy. We've learned a lot through academic research. Um, and also keeping in mind that the world is a different place now than it was mm. 10 years ago, in part due to a lot of the policy choices we've made. So. Scenario, so uh, j just to make it concrete, uh, a nuclear kind of sabotage attack on a nuclear power plant domestically. But you know who did it? Based, uh, Al, Al Qaeda. Okay. So foreign based Al Qaeda. Um, based where? Sorry? <laughs> based where? Sorry. Foreign based where? Foreign based. New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> um, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. Okay. okay. Saudi Arabia, oh, Pakistan. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Oh. You can tell I'm not an expert on this stuff. Okay. So, um, so the two-part question is, one might, what might happen differently, and what, based on your research, would you emphasize um, if you were tapped to give uh, some advice to the NSC about what they should be paying, paying attention to? So, really so the, different, you know, the different parts here are what should we be paying attention to, and what do you think we actually will, how do we think we actually will respond, given what we've learned, nevertheless? Okay. Start. I go first, too. That was quick. Um. <laughs> One thing I think that we've learned, and this goes back into the, the America's image around the world a little bit, which we I think we recognize uh, is much more important than the Bush administration originally thought. They thought that if we were just fighting a virtuous war against evil, as they would portray it, then the world would just rally behind us. Uh, that ended pretty quickly. Um, so I think we could learn something from the Obama administration, which maintained the same sort of hardline policies, but repackaged them in, in a different way that they're not going to be popular in large parts of the world. I think there have been a tremendous amount of deaths of civilians with drone strikes and other operations, some of which we don't know about or can't talk about. Um, so I think that's the, the number one thing would be we wouldn't go with this smoke them out either with us or against us uh, kind of rhetoric. And the second thing, now that's the good, that's the good side. The bad side is, and this is, I, I, this is a view I've had for a while and I've lived through some of this stuff, um, uh, terrorist attacks like that, in my opinion politically, are the great sleeping giant of American politics. Mm -hmm. And it'll be very, and, and I agree that we're never going to completely eliminate terrorism. And as much as smart political leaders are going to try to educate the American people that, that this is just going to happen from time to time, and as Beth said and I said in my beginning, we can't overreact to it because it's just going to make the matters worse and, and create a cycle. 
nonetheless, in a democracy, and this is something more page about you know democracies reacting policy-wise rather than workers on the context of who's rising up against them. Democracies are under tremendous pressure also uh, to protect the public, and you often do see shifts to the right and shifts to um, certain hardline tactics. You saw that in Israel after uh, 2000. Uh, you saw the United States after the 9-11 attacks. So I think we would also end up with some pretty hardline policies as well. Um, some of them would remain a little bit more secret. Let me, give, let me counter your thing for half a second. Um, if it wasn't just a one-time attack, but there was also, like the 9-11 attacks, there was a suspicion that, that we didn't know enough about who the enemy was and how many more attacks were coming, that was the genesis of torture. That was the genesis of coercive interrogations. Three individuals were tortured under those procedures in, in 18 months, and then th that system essentially stopped. But we still were engaging in renditions, and we still are. But uh, I believe that if there was still a swirl that that was one of several potential attacks, we would probably see this current administration or any administration act very similar to the way the Bush administration did. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm saying that's reality. And they wouldn't come out and say we're going to do torture memos and make them public someday and have you know the, the inspector general uh, release them to the public. That's never going to happen again. But they would probably still in, they would probably engage in those similar policies for the main reason that they are responsible and they're going to be held responsible and accountable. And I think unfortunately in that scenario we would see America go pretty hardcore. Although we would probably package it a little bit differently because we saw some of those major costs after 9/11. One just quick informational question for Stuart. When you say we're still doing renditions, do you yeah. mean we are still capturing people in foreign countries yes. and sending them to countries where we know they will be tortured? Absolutely. Oh, well, we're not saying we know that they will be tortured. Not we that we say, say publicly, but are we, but we doing this? Yes. Yes. Uh, what yeah, is your evidence least, of that? Uh, we can talk after. It's at least as much as we were doing in after four or five years after 9 11. Uh, That's very disturbing, yeah. but well, I'd like well, to see we, the evidence. We, we replaced coercive interrogations with two things. More rendition, when, when Obama outlawed torture, we replaced it with two things. Number one, more renditions. So we outsourced the information we gathered, which, by the way, is not as reliable anymore. We don't have oversight over who's doing the information gathering. And number two, we replaced it with drone strikes. And we're now killing a lot of these individuals instead of capturing them and interrogating them. So the, instead of the, the waterboard. Drone strikes, drone I, strike. I buy very much. Um, but I would be very surprised if you're actually correct yeah. that we are rendering people on a regular basis to be tortured. Just because my sense is that I didn't, the I didn't that say they we're doing it on a okay to be my my sense well that's what extraordinary rendition well, meant I, I, and let I, me finish this does. thought okay the reason that I would be surprised about this is because my understanding is that the general perception among people who practice international security policy in the administration and in the bureaucracies in the United States have come to the agreement that information that is gathered under torture doesn't tend to be very reliable. And that the only time that it ever would make sense to put anybody into that extreme situation is if there was an immediate threat of an attack. For example, if somebody had um, people who were being kept hostage that they were threatening to kill. And so it really surprised me if we're still doing extraordinary rendition the way that it was being done immediately after September 11th. But I'd like to see your evidence. Yeah, I didn't say immediately okay. after 9 11. Okay, okay. so I think this is a subject for another panel. Okay, so let me, let me just get on to, to what I think would happen. Um, I think that there, that kind of there would not be a witch hunt of ethnic groups the way that um, there sort of was a, a witch hunt against uh, immigrants uh, immediately following September 11th, because I think we've learned about the importance of political inclusiveness um, because the political exclusion and the thought of not having fair treatment is associated with terrorism. I think that instead we would be tr turning more at a domestic level to um, neighborhood local policing that is very sympathetic to local groups um, because there's an understanding that sympathy is a better way of getting information. I think f in terms of foreign events, there would be airstrikes rather than on the ground forces sent um, because there's not a desire to have another large uh, on the ground military presence. I think if it were in fact the case that this attack uh, came from people who were in Pakistan, it would very likely um, just completely end our cooperation with Pakistan. I think that the, the pressure would become enormous to stop saying that Pakistan um, was any kind of ally whatsoever. I think it would speed up our withdrawal from Afghanistan stand and increase our cooperation with India. Uh, I don't have too much more to add to that. Uh, <laughs> I would just say, um, as, as both previous panels say, sort of the, the, the stylistic approach, I think, would be different. And that really is um, a lesson learned, that even if you're going to engage in many of the similar sort of, sort of tactics, the framing of them as more of a uh, you know global uh, multilateral kind of enterprises is, is quite important. One thing I would, I, I would just say, lessons learned, is the media environment now, the global media environment, is very different than it was 10 years ago. This is now an era where we have Russia Today, 
Uh, China International just started broadcasting. We all know about Al Jazeera and its importance in the Arab Spring. And so, um, you know, it's not as if the United States hasn't always struggled with security versus values or double standards or doing different kinds of deals with different kinds of places. So, you know, it's always been the case. Uh, the problem that U.S. policymakers now face is that instantaneously these what I call sort of hypocrisy costs are broadcast, right? That the sort of split screen of what we're doing in Uzbekistan versus what we're trying to promote in Iraq is just so immediate. It's so pressing that our contradictory policies towards Libya and Egypt are there for everyone to see. And so, you know, that makes the sort of nudging of these things, the invocation of sort of more, you know, principle-based sort of action a lot more difficult uh, than it was in the past, even though really we've, we've faced these dilemmas in, in, in many different eras. I also don't have a, a whole lot to add. I, I guess there's um, what I hope would I, what I hope we have learned, but I'm not entirely sure we have learned. I would hope that the response would be um, much more focused on the group that attacked us and where they uh, had been harbored and whoever had been harboring. That's why I asked you sort of to specify who it was, um, as opposed to say another state that had nothing to do with the initial attacks. Yeah. Rock. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, I hope that would be true, um, and I hope there would be more of an appreciation of um, the fact that that really the 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 main way that such effects can be such attacks can be effective is in promoting an overreaction, and that that would keep us from overreacting. I don't know that it would for you know whoever was mentioning the, you know the sort of domestic politics within the U.S. and the the need to sort of you know take a hard line. Um, um, I think it would also, uh, what, what would happen would depend in part on what had happened between now and these hypothetical attacks in terms of the drawdown in Afghanistan and how that, would, how that would play politically. I don't know how it would play politically, but if we had completely withdrawn and then there's an attack, would there be blaming of, oh, we got out too soon, we, you know, we left this, um, or, you know, or how, you know, how that would play out it would depend on where the attack came from and what kind of information there was about it. And maybe that sets you up, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. So I don't know how many of you have seen the Coen Brothers movie, uh, Burn After Reading, but there's a scene at the end where a character that's representing a CIA division chief talking about some shenanigans that have gone on in the movie says, well, what do we learn from this? And he kind of looks around, nobody has an answer, he says, well, I guess we learned not to effing do that again. <laughs> and I think that is true both of the United States, but crucially, of a lot of other countries. So what have we learned? We have learned that maybe invading countries that sort of kind of we don't like and maybe looks, if you squint really hard, kind of look like the people that attacked us, i.e. Iraq, is maybe a terrible idea. Um, I think that we have immunized ourselves at least for a generation against that sort of foolishness. So that's good if costly. Um, but it doesn't get us out of the problem uh, that we had facing the, the Taliban regime in the fall of 2001, which is we said, look, we don't want to fight you. Cough up Bin Laden and we'll call it a day. And they said, well, um, no, maybe we'll drag our feet. And we were not in a foot dragging kind of mood, nor would we be in the scenario that, uh, that Tanya posits. Um, so what have other people learned? Well, other people have learned that um, a good way to lose your country is to be non-responsive when the United States says, we want terrorist X. Um, the Pakistanis have certainly learned this. They are incredibly uncooperative in many ways on helping us uh, against their proxies in Afghanistan. But, you know, as recent arrests have shown, they continue, despite all of the fallout of the bin Laden raid, et cetera, et cetera, they continue to ar arrest al-Qaeda affiliates. So that's good. Um, the same is true of the Saudis. You know, the, they let money flow out of their country that supports various causes. Um, but there's not much terrorism based in, inside Saudi Arabia as opposed to sort of money flowing out that goes to terror. So other countries have learned that this is a bad deal. Um, so what would happen in the, in the scenario that Tanya posits? Um, in the case of Saudi Arabia, they would be beside themselves to find who did it and get them to us if they didn't just cut their heads off themselves. Um, the Saudis are you know, sometimes ineffectual but quite ruthless. Um, as you know, For those of you who haven't read the book, The Siege of Mecca, I would recommend it. It's sort of the, the, the kickoff event of the age of Islamic terror. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the holy of holies, and they were happy to shell the hell out of that place. So 
the, the Saudis, you know, sensing that, that something bad could be in the wind, uh, would be quick to, to do everything they could. Pakistanis probably would be as well, um, because the end of the relationship with the United States has, has real consequences for them. And it's even worse if we decide, oh, by the way, we're going to start doing what we did with bin Laden on a massive scale. Um, they don't want to get into a war with the U.S. They will if they have to, but they have no great love for, for Al Qaeda, so they would do whatever they could, and they can be awfully ruthless and nasty too, to hand over at least somebody. So I think it would look in many ways quite different from the post 9 11 um, response in ways that are, would be ugly and maybe we don't want to see, but would, would be a lot less costly in the long run. Oh, and just one note on drones D drones don't substitute for capturing people. We would love to capture all of the people we kill with drones. The problem is they're not places we can easily and safely get to. Um, drones are the, a very specific technical solution to a weird political problem, which is the, the sort of ungoverned nation state spaces. Um, so they're used in areas where you know, rendition would be difficult if not impossible because not only do we lack a real presence there, the actual host nation government lacks a presence. So yeah, we would by all means love to capture and interrogate all of these dudes. Um, it's, it's just kind of tough to do so when they're in somebody else's territory and, and that somebody doesn't like you being there. Tanya, could I jump in for half a second on that? Half a second. Um, I don't agree with that. Uh, the Obama administration does not want to capture all these people and interrogate them and find places to put them because they're under extreme stress on whether to have military commissions or not. And uh, we've not seen the But we of still captured. are capturing them. They are capturing them in Afghanistan. We just don't capture them in Pakistan much. I mean, they're, they're, we still have a facility at Bagram. In fact, Bagram has come to substitute in some ways for Guantanamo. You're absolutely no, right. No, I agree, but that's exactly the point. It's they, not, it's not, well, we but, can talk more about this, but. Well, uh, sure, but there, my point problem. is, we would, we, I mean, it's Osama a, bin Laden probably problem. accepted. We would like to interrogate most of these guys. All right, well, thank you very much. I'd like uh, everybody to join me in thanking this fantastic uh, panel. And uh, also thanks to the audience for a really great set of questions. And uh, thank you very much for your time today.